Hi, my name is Deborah Kiak Franson, and I'm the outlier here. I'm glad I'm used to that uh, position. I'm also newly the Associate Vice President for Digital Education and Engagement at the University of Colorado System down in Denver. Um, I'm there after nearly 15 years here on campus um, with OIT, with the Atlas Institute, with the CIO, um, and uh, most recently as Director of Academic Technology. And big shout out to the A team out there. Um, I'm pleased to be here because when I was here, I was always frustrated because digital humanities is so close to my heart, and you'll see why in a few minutes. And I could never seem to kind of get the energy moving or, or brought together that you guys have. So big round of applause. You guys did a really good job bringing everybody together. So thank you. Now, when I say I'm an outlier, I'm not kidding. Now, you may think I'm a technologist, and um, I feel like I'm coming home because it's not pedantic for me to quote from literature. Um, I am, in the words of Penthesilea, talking to Cassandra in Christoph novel, Cassandra, nicht Fisch, nicht Fleisch. Please don't ask me to speak German. All that's left are curse words and offensive things to say. Um, so I am neither fish nor fowl in all of this. And you'll see as I go through why, why that is. But um, I, have a, I have a long history in the humanities. My PhD is in German literature. Um, I, I miss it. And when I was introduced to digital humanities many years ago at a conference, um, I thought, gosh, what, would, what could you do with digital humanities, that idea in literature? And I came up with this great idea that it would be like virtual reality, and we'd have these headsets, and we'd be going along, and we'd be exploring time and space and the, the, the transmission of romantic ideals throughout Europe, America, and all around the world. And we could move forward in time and backward and see how all this works. But unfortunately, I have neither the time nor the expertise to do it. But that idea has always stuck in my head. And that's why I was always just fascinated by what everyone is doing. And then when I moved to the dark side of IT, I thought, well, how, do you, how would you support that? What would you need to put into place? Um, we'd need lots of money, um, first of all, but um, you know, on the dark side, we have more zeros um, on, our, our, on our budgets than on the humanities side. So it's not impossible, even though great resources would be needed. But one of the things that came to my mind, and especially after working with colleagues in the libraries, is that I felt that we really needed a team approach to this. And that was something different. So. When I was in graduate school in the humanities, I went to the library by myself, and I read, and I read, and I read until my eyes bled. I mean, you know how that goes. And you had your little, your little index cards, and you'd write your things on your index cards, and then you'd try to make a picture out of them if you're a visual thinker, and try to figure out all this stuff that you had read. Um, and what I realized is that we needed some way to have, and again, dark side, administrators understand what's happening. So when administrators talk to researchers, say, in the sciences, they get it. They get it. We know what your research question is. You do research. We understand it. You do all of this. But what is there on the humanities side? So what I came up with was a model, a conceptual model for digital humanities support. And there are so many assumptions in here that we could have our own feast day. But if you'll bear with me, it's in its infancy. And whatever feedback you have for it, that would be great. But what I hope is that people could take this out and be able to explain to the non-practitioner who thinks that humanists just read books or just do silly courses. Um, I heard, overheard that in the bookstore this morning. Um, but rather show the, the rigor um, of the creative or research process that's happening all across this campus. So again, the assumptions, and there are many, begin with process. First of all, that there is a process that, that is, if you look at it at the coarsest level, fairly consistent um, with research practice in the humanities. Huge assumption, and we can argue about that one. Um, it's also, I would argue, implicit in all of the disciplines. And what I'm trying to do here is make it explicit, which I don't see happen very much. Um, when I did a master's program in education, it was very clear to me, it was made very explicit what I had to do as a research pr practitioner in the social sciences. I knew I had to, I, I knew the steps, I knew the processes, I knew what I had to do. In the humanities, it was the process, as, as I was introduced to it, was pretty much, here are the stacks, go to a conference. 
And that's about all the, uh, as explicit as the research process was. Um, when I took this process and tried to make it two-dimensional, I lost a lot in it. So I lost the organic piece of it. I lost the iterative nature of, of research. Um, but I also noticed that, that the methodology in, in my model might be a little bit different. So again, it was the Lone Ranger methodology. And we can argue that the Lone Ranger had Silver and Tonto and Scout, but really it's pretty much about the lone researcher there in the stacks. And now we're going to a posse mentality. Um, and so that's, that may be a cultural shift for a lot of people in the humanities. Um, the second thing, and I'll turn to Mel for this one, the theoretical, completely gone. It's gone, it's just not even there. Like if I could do 3D, maybe, but, uh, but it's gone and I just wanted to recognize that. Now what I realized is that each step in this process, there were new partnerships and roles that might not have been there in the, in the past. So here it is, and it, it, this is version two. Version one was linear, so I've improved it to circular, but that's about it. So what I'm purporting is that there's, there's a research question. There's something, we're, we're exploring something. There's a field, we don't know what it is. Sometimes, again, we do have to read in the sex. We have to walk around, we have to talk to other people. Like you said, going to conferences and getting those great ideas. And then there's something, there, is, there, there are data out there. But when I was reading, it was, it was textual data. You might have an actual material, piece of material data. You might have um, a, a text. Somebody might have image. Somebody might have an audio file. Somebody might have census data. Um, somebody might have events that happen over time. Then there is a process of analysis where you say, what does all of this mean? Um, and then we go to a presentation. And I agree with Mel on this one, that, that we do go for that product. There has to be something. We've always thought that it should be a nice monograph um, or a nice uh, article in a peer-reviewed journal, but there's some sort of something there. Um, I would argue that in the digital humanities, that, that presentation, how you provide that to a louder, louder uh, larger audience is, uh, is that maybe? It's funny when you get to the okay. of the speakers, it bounces off the wall. Oh, okay. Um, and then there's dissemination. So we've got to get it out there someplace. Um, what I would argue is that we need to look at all of this simultaneously and keep that in our heads when we're talking to people about getting the support that we need for the work that we do. Often, I think people uh, gravitate toward one part of this or another, and I can point right to the front row. Jim's really, really big on this. So I've talked to Jim so many times, and I'll say, what about digital humanities? And he'll say, e-journal. Let's get a new e-journal, which we need, but we also need to have all of these other things in place, too. So, again, what I realized is that in each part of this, we had different relationships, partnerships, people who needed to come together and collaborate in this area. And I apologize for the clip art. Um, it's all I could find. Um, so the mortarboard is, of course, the faculty member, the researcher. Um, when you, if you do clip art librarian, woohoo, <laughs> you guys are apparently sexy. Um, so there are lots of other inappropriate clip arts for librarians. Um, so I just, I just, uh, yeah, to um, raise my eyebrows, I have to tell you that. So when we're looking for the research question, you've got that faculty member, the, the librarians probably come in with the content. And um, so we think about Thea's content. She's got all the posters. She's got all of this visual content. You've got text context, you've, uh, content. You've got the data. So we really rely on the librarians there. And then when, we're, then when we start to talk about um, discovery, so of course this is the IT side of things, and, and I'll digress for just a moment. Um, back, so this has been bubbling in my head for probably three or four years. Back when I first thought of this, I thought, this was the IT shop on campus. But what I'm noticing, and not just here, but around the country, is that the IT shop is turning into a nuts and bolts organization. Um, and that now, after hearing Jen talk, this may be distributed across disciplines where the disciplinary IT knowledge is very specific, um, where the graduate student knowledge is very specific. Oh, and you two ought to get together, because like I just told Matthias, you have his database. So that would be, you know, be great. 
Um, but again, we've got data when you're, you're going out there and then you need to do something with it. And this is when we talk about storage. What do we do with it? What do we do with devices? What do we do, what do, we do with security? Um, I used to talk to librarian colleagues and say, I'm so glad you have that preservation thing on your plate because I could never deal with it. Like what do you do with the data as, it, um, as file types transition over time? I'm so glad that's yours and not mine. Um, and then we have analysis. And this is where we need um, not just the, the hardware and the software, but the expertise to actually crunch the data and figure it out. Like, how do you, I don't know, how do you crunch poster data? What do you do with, like, how do you, I mean, do you pull the metadata? How do you do that? What do you, what, what patterns do you look for? It's like what Matthias has with looking at that, how do you pull out that, that pattern recognition across so much information that you can't, um, you can't possibly do it in your head. Now, the, um, the astrophysicists, they can snort at the humanists and say, well, we have so much data. You guys have nothing. But I would argue that, that hum humanity's data is a little bit more complex and comes across in different formats than just numerical, so that it might be actually uh, a more complicated piece of work here. Um, and then there's that presentation piece. Um, for me, the I'm, I'm a visual learner. I realize that now I am. Um, I have worked with a career coach and she can't say anything without me saying, oh, well, you know this scene in this movie? And I'll explain the whole thing or I'll send her pictures. She'll give me homework and I'll send her a picture back. And I'm realizing over time that I'm really attracted to the visualization of big, complex ideas. You lose a little bit in the translation. But for me, I think this is one of the ways that you can get, so if your goal for your presentation is to get your ideas, your research, findings out to a bigger audience. Sometimes visualization is the only way to do it so that people can watch things change or move or, or understand the relationships between them. And then for the dissemination piece, again, e-journals. Um, how do you get that out there? Websites where you can add comments. And so that's, those are just my pretty, they're not quite raw, but they're not cooked. Um, ideas about this. Now, it still leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Um, and that is, can we really identify the support needed for broad work in the digital humanities using this? Maybe, maybe not. Um, will this scale? Is the di <coughs> digital humanities initiative a teleological march of the humanities toward a utopic vision of digital research? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, does this change the humanities research culture too much or not enough? Um, and then where do we get the money? But those, those are just a few of them. And as to the, um, the title, uh, I, I knew I would do this. I sent that title around three weeks into a new job and somebody said, oh, you've got to put, I said, it's boring, can somebody help me? Somebody said, oh, put hashtag, no filter, hashtag YOLO on there. Um, he said, because you certainly don't filter anything. I'm like, yeah, that's right. So then I went to my son for it, um, and I said, we were frisbeeing the dog back and forth. I said, so, Jonathan, what do you think about this title? He said, oh, that's stupid. It looks like you're trying too hard. And then he sent the frisbee back. He said, wait, is this a presentation for old people like you? And, said, yes. and then he said, oh, they'll think it's cool, so put it in. <laughs> so I hope this helps kind of structure some of your thinking as you go forward and request funds from the powers that be. And I hope to have enough bandwidth to continue to watch the great work that you're all doing. So thank you.